Genesis 12, 1 through 4, common English Bible. Abram's family moves to Canaan. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your land, your family, and your father's household for the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and will bless you. I will make your name respected, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, those who curse you, I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. Abram left just as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he left for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite childhood memories, I was probably eight or nine years old, was one Saturday morning when my dad walked into the house and said, pack up the car, we're going to Winnipeg. I only lived about an hour from Canada, but I had never crossed the border before. But Mom looked at him like, yeah, thanks a lot for asking me. I've got a few things to do. But Dad was often spontaneous. Perhaps a little irritated, my mom got on it and called my favorite grandma to come with us. I was so excited. Winnipeg, I thought, was exotic. <laughs> TV commercials for stores in Winnipeg only played late at night, like when I was wasn't supposed to be up watching Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Winnipeg was foreign, and my mind spun with fantasies. And sure enough, my fantasies came true when I turned on the TV in the motel and saw Bugs Bunny speaking French. <laughs> <laughs> and I was reminded of that magical weekend when I read the verse that follows our reading from Genesis today. We heard how Abram heard the voice of God say, you know, leave your land, family, and all of that. And then it says, Abram took his wife Sarai, along with their possessions and people, and set forth for the land of Canaan. And at first I thought, why doesn't it simply say, and Abram and Sarai set off together for Canaan? Because I realized Abram probably never consulted with Sarai. What do you think? Should we? Just like my dad never asked my mom, he just announced it and took us and everything else, and we went along. Perhaps Sarai was accustomed to Abram saying, let's pick everything up and leave everything behind. After all, they were nomadic. But no, not nomadic in the sense of a, a few tents and some sheep. Abram was the ancient counterpart of a wealthy Bedouin sheik, ruling over hundreds of subjects and surrounded by retainers. They're like small merchants that cater to sizable communities like that, plus all their animals, symbol of their wealth. So they didn't, nor could they just spontaneously pick up and move regularly. But Abram's family had already made an especially big move. He and Sarai were born and raised in Ur, which is near the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, today in Iraq. And Abram's father moved the whole clan to what is Turkey today, which is no small move. It's about 600 miles, about Denver to Des Moines. And you imagine doing this 4,000 years ago. This next move to Canaan would be another about 400 miles or so, and then they moved to Egypt, and then they moved back from Egypt. So according to rabbinic tradition, Abram's father was a maker and seller of various statues of idols and gods. Somewhere, somehow along the way, Abram was convinced there's only one God. So the story is told that Abram took an axe to all his father's idols and smashed all of them except one and put the axe in the hand of the remaining idol. Abram pointed and blamed that idol for killing all the others. <laughs> his father said that's impossible. The idol is not alive. It's only clay. And Abram asked, so then why do you worship clay and not that which is living? Quick aside, I hope we see this story. It's not an excuse to destroy other people's uh, religious objects. 
but rather an origin story of Abram's embrace of monotheism. And so it is that Abram is considered the father of all monotheists, those who believe in one God. The three Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. Muslims through Hagar and their son Ishmael, and Jews and Christians through Sarah and their son Isaac. There's never a really a, an explanation of why, but he believed in a living God. In fact, the living God, one God, not many. And it was from that one God that he heard a voice saying, move and I will show you the land. How did he know? How indeed? Last Sunday, during the second hour, Jenny invited 30 of us gathered to tell our experiences of the Holy Spirit. Once the first person got the courage to speak first, stories just kept coming. And I was struck by what I, was, what I imagined were experiences similar to Abram. Listen to the collected wisdom of this congregation, the descriptions that were given by folks here last week. First is a sense that I'm in the right place at the right time, or not. A sense that things are well in the world, or they are not, and that means I have to address it. Another said, a feeling, sometimes a, a contradiction when I'm resistant to something, other times a feeling of expansion when I am open to where the Holy Spirit is leading. Another described as a healing presence. Someone said, it comes to me in dreams and messages like, now is the time. Another said, it's like how I am overwhelmed to tears every time we sing, here I am. Another described the Holy Spirit as a light, a literal light upon us. Another said, it's like a tug or a push for me to do something. One person had said, said, it's when I feel a total interconnection with another, another uh, human being. And several people use the word connection to another person, for example, when it becomes clear we're talking about the same things in our own ways. Or connections to just the right person God has put in our life at just the right moment. Or a sense of timelessness. Or a reassuring flow of energy. Or knowing like what is meant to be will be. Or a force that drives me forward, even in my weakest moments. Not just in my social justice work, but also in my personal weakest moments. Another described a state of flow. Words and actions just come out, and I have no idea why. I don't even have to try. <clears throat> or an unspoken command that I have to respond. Or a chill causing me to look up. Something that perhaps is a foretelling, and other times a foreboding. Last but not least, awe and humility. So powerful it causes me to fall on my knees. Aren't these amazing? All from a group of progressive liberal social justice Christians. <laughs> sometimes accused of being more in our heads than in our hearts. And imagine what would happen if we lived exclusively in one or the other. I'm grateful for combinations of all of the above because each time another outrageous example of cruelty pops up on our news feed, when I ask, what is it now, or who's been targeted, or who's being blamed, or what is the lie now, or why is that lie even necessary? What river or ocean is going to be filled with what mining debris now? Every time I open a page or turn on the TV, my brain is assaulted by ignorance and my heart is broken by the gleeful brutality against people we love and people we don't know, and 
despair for the earth. Thank God for the Holy Spirit to intervene with sighs too deep for words. We are not left powerless, brain dead, or harmless. The question isn't just what should we do, but what are we being drawn toward? What gift or talent do I have that's exactly for this moment, you know, just such a time as this? And what is our unique gift and contribution? <clears throat> I believe that if we pay attention, we will know. Maybe it's a tug, or a push, or as one described it last week, a dummy slap. <laughs> a slap upside the head that says, pay attention! Now, some might call these gentle or less than gentle experiences an intuition. Not the work of the Holy Spirit, but I call intuition a gift of the Spirit. Or instead, you might simply say, this is how I experience God. Because we follow a living God. Active today, not just in history, not just an idea or a story from long ago. Even so, those stories inform and encourage us. How did our ancestors, like Abram, Sarai, know what to do? How to balance risk and trust? How to move forward without knowing what's ahead, just knowing that we must. Often without knowing why. Like for us, I would suggest some combination of paying attention to a sense or unknowing, a feeling, perhaps a chill. Sometimes present, sometimes present in our tears and dreams, or as energy and light and flow and connection, or a command to which I must respond. If not now, then someday, and credit to my dad, a certain amount of spontaneity. But back to that command, or rather a call, as one of our lunch and lectionary participants said on Thursday at Noodles and Company, a call is anything you do that is outside your comfort zone, that comes from within, from inside, like, I've got to do this. And then how do we respond? So perhaps we might respond, why in the world would I do that? Or you might respond excited, I knew this day would come. Or you might respond, well, I knew this day would come. <laughs> or you might say, I know. And then never do anything more with it until it comes up again. Or you might respond, okay, God, but here's the deal. <laughs> that story Jeremy told was pretty amazing. But then let's see how that works out. And I've done every one of these more than once. Or we could say, okay, Lord, here I am. Send me. But even if that's our response, so the journey for Abram and Sarai wasn't from point A to point B. It wasn't like God said go, and so it was all made really easy and smooth. And it true for us, too. And perhaps one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture is verse 9 in this chapter. And they journeyed on by stages. Which reminds us our journey is never complete. Because here we are, 4,000 years later, and thankfully, the living God <coughs> is 